Hello and good evening. Thank you for joining us on your Friday night. My name is Jessica Lewis and I'm the Sales and Marketing Manager at Playwrights Canada Press. I'm very excited to host what will be a really interesting discussion on the publication of The Breathing Hole, or what is called a Nutshilling Me Too, a glue. We'll, we will be hearing from author Colleen Murphy and translator Janet Tamalik McGrath, facilitated by Renelta Arluk, the director of the show Stratford Festival World Premiere. Siobhan Arnaziak Murphy, who worked with Colleen on the book, is unable to be here with us tonight. Colleen and Janet will be discussing how the play was fully translated into Nutshilling YouTube for publication, the creative partnership with Inuit community members and artists, and how the play addresses the climate emergency. But first, I'd like to acknowledge that Colleen, Janet, Renelta, and I are joining you from the traditional territories of many peoples, such as the Anishinaabe, Wendat, members of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Métis, Stony Nakoda Nations, Blackfoot Confederacy, Tsutsina, Ohlone, and Coast Miwok. We thank these peoples for their stewardship and their leadership. I'm very privileged to live in Toronto or Tukaranto, the place in the water where the trees are standing. Tukaranto is governed by the dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant. This agreement asks us to only take what we need from the land and the water so that the environment can prosper, a sentiment that is also very close to the heart of the breathing hole. With this in mind, today I've made a donation to Oceans North, an organization that promotes policies that address the environmental changes taking place in Northern marine ecosystems and ensures that they're protected within the framework of indigenous knowledge, rights and consultation. I will leave a link in the chat if you'd like to check them out. The press is also grateful for the funding we receive from the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, the Department of Canadian Heritage and Ontario Creates. Without their contributions, we wouldn't be able to bring you all of the, our wonderful books and host events such as this. Now to introduce our guests. Colleen Murphy won the 2016 and the 2007 Governor General's Literary Award for Drama for her plays Pig Girl and The December Man, Longer December respectively. Both plays were also awarded the Carol Bolt Award. Other plays include The Society for Destitute Presents Titus Plafonius, Armstrong's War, The Goodnight Bird, and Beating Heart Cadaver. She is also a librettist with works such as Phantasma for composer Ian Cousin, My Mouth on Your Heart for composer August Murphy King, and Oxana G for composer Aaron Gervais. She has been writer in residence at six universities and playwright in residence at two Canadian theatres, as well as Finborough Theatre in the UK. Janet Tomalik McGrath grew up in naturally culture in the 1970s. Throughout her childhood and early teen years, she lived on the land in the summers with the Nutshilling Mute families, becoming fluent in the dialect and familiar with traditional values and teachings. After high school, she became a regional interpreter translator for the Nutshilling area, innovating on audio presentation modes, assisting in the documentation of grammar, and supporting script and font amendments to reflect the dialect's unique phonemes. Her MA thesis was conducted in document documented in Nutshilling Mute dialect. Currently, she works as a language advocate and consultant for Nutshilling communities. She was approached by Kyogyavut Society for assistance with the breathing hole. And Renelta Arluk is currently the Director of Indigenous Arts at the BAMP Center for Arts and Creativity, where she is responsible for the vision to, des to design Indigenous arts-led program across all artistic disciplines and offers support for inclusionary programming. She earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts acting degree from the University of Alberta, becoming the first Indigenous woman and first Inuk to graduate from the program. Renelta is also the first Inuk and Indigenous woman to direct at the Stratford Festival, where she directed the world premiere of The Breathing Hole. In 2008, Renelta founded Akpik Theatre, the only professional Indigenous theatre company in the Northwest Territories. Renelta is Inuvialuit, Cree, and Den from the Northwest Territories. Lastly, a few housekeeping notes. We have turned on both the chat and the Q&A features for tonight. If you have questions for Colleen and Janet, please submit them via the Q&A and we will address them at the end. We are recording this event for later viewing. So if you're interested in viewing it again, you can contact me at info at playwrightscanada.com or look out for it on our website. I would also like to remind you that the book is currently 25% off on our website, which means you can get it for under $15. But we also encourage you to support your favorite local bookstores. And it's beautiful. So you, I think you'd want a copy. So now I'm going to welcome Colleen, Janet, and Renata onto your screens, and I hope you enjoy this conversation of the breathing hole. Merci, Jocelyn, Jessica. <laughs> there you are. Okay, goodbye. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Excellent. Masi Chokuyanik, I just want to say welcome to from Treaty 7 territory here uh, in uh, Banff, Alberta. That's where I currently reside. Uh, beautiful territory, the Blackfoot, Sutton of the Dene, and uh, Sony Nakota, as well as Metis Local 3. And I was uh, just reflecting on Jessica's land acknowledgement, which was quite wonderful and 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 um, and, and uh, inclusive. I always found that um, Indigenous also include Inuit when they do their own acknowledgement of land, which shows how deeply relational we've been for many, many generations. I, I'm really grateful to be here to speak with Colleen and with Janet. This has been an incredible project that I've been a part of and grateful to have been a part of. And so before we dig in, I think we all want to know the story and we want to hear the story. And I feel pretty excited that Colleen is going to share uh, the story of the breathing hole with us. So Kuyanik, Colleen, nice to see you. Nice to see you again. <laughs> um, thank you. So I'm just going to briefly do a summary of the play. It's, it's a bit hard to summarize because it's big, but um, if, if you've seen it or, or then you'll know it, but stop me if you've heard this before. Um, and before I start uh, to read this, I, I just want to say that I'm really terrible with audio comprehension, which is why I'm going to read this to you. And so the way I say something will probably differ from the Nachilik because the language is a bit hard for me to pronounce. So the breathing hole is about the life and death of a 500 year old bear. There are 37 characters in the play. The play takes place on one location in the traditional homelands of the Nutshalik people. The play is structured in three acts and each act has two scenes and there's a few years uh, between uh, each scene. Act one, it takes place in 1535, act two in 1845, and act three in uh, 2035. So in act one, in a small Nutshalik village, there's a widow and she happens upon a tiny bear cub and she wants to raise him and be his human mother. But there's quite a bit of uh, pushback from the, from the community. However, she decides to keep him and she calls him Ungaruk. And by scene two, the bear has grown to uh, 1500 pounds and it's a fixture in the community and he often catches seals for them. But when it's discovered that he has a mate, he has to leave the community and never return. So Humitok reluctantly says goodbye. And then after the bear leaves, she and the, the community look out over the sea water and they see white sails and they think, oh, this must be a strange winged creature. But what they are seeing is the mid 19th century ushering in the sails of John Franklin ships, which brings us to act two. And in scene one, Franklin and his crew are watching the Northern Lights when Ungorok and his mate come along and the bear tries to give Franklin a seal in much the same way as he used to offer them to Humitok. But Franklin is suspicious and frightened. So the bears leave. And when they leave, two naturally hunters come by and there's quite a dust up on either, because either side, you know, the Brits and the Inuit, they don't understand each other. Now by scene two, Franklin's men are starving and in desperation, they try to shoot the bear, but they miss. Then again, two of the neutrally hunters come by and Franklin begs them for help. And the hunters are torn between wanting to help Franklin and needing to find food for their own families. And after the hunters leave, crew members bring in the mutilated body of Ongarok's mate. And they feast on the female polar bear as Franklin looks out to sea. And he thinks what he's seeing out there is Cathay. But what he's actually seeing is a 40,000 ton, 400 foot tall drilling platform in the 21st century, rising out of the waters of the Northwest Passage, which brings us to the final act. And in act three, the bear is now very old and very hungry. And he's hanging around where the old breathing hole used to be, hoping that he, he might catch a scent or sight of Humituk. 
And along come a group of entrepreneurs and they are building a high-end green cruise ship. And they're having this fun visit while accompanying an advertising photo shoot for their new adventure. And they're upset about the oil rig. A Nuchlik biologist interrupts them as she tracks an old bear that has rarely been sighted. And feeling that his territory is threatened, the bear reappears and he attacks one of the investors. The biologist intervenes, saving a bad situation from getting worse. By act three, scene two, the entrepreneurs and their guests are now on the cruise ship making their maiden voyage. And despite terrible oil spills in the Northwest Passage and a temperature of 25 degrees Celsius on December the 31st, the entrepreneurs are celebrating and ushering in a brand new year, 2035. And suddenly, out of nowhere, Ungarak, starving, tries to climb up the rungs of the cruise ship. I won't talk about the end, suffice to say, Homitok saw very, very far into the future. But tonight is not so much about the play as it is about the book. And I have to say that this book was birthed by a total cultural and linguistic collaboration between Siobhan and Janet and myself. So let's dig in. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> That was incredible. The um, the process of of writing the play to lead to this moment ha has actually been as monumentous, I and in some ways, as the story itself, and bringing in all those multiple voices in in, in different aspects and. I think what is most exciting and what I'm really looking forward to hearing is you, Janet, talking about what it was like to, um, to translate and to work with Janet and Siobhan on digging into this work that goes from so far in the past to so far in the future. And I remember the first meeting we had, which was so, I believe in some ways serendipitous that the that you have experience in theater and that you have this incredible um, breadth of, of, uh, of knowledge with the language. And so when we met, when I met you and when Colleen and I met you, I, I felt like this was a meeting of some incredible minds. And so I'm pretty excited to kind of hear about the process and what it's been like for you. Mm. <clears throat> Well, I think the first, um, uh, the, uh, was a big hurdle at the beginning. Uh, Inuktut syllabics, um, it looks really complicated. Um, you, you might want to open up the book and show a page. I don't have a copy handy, but, uh, but for the, for the um, people watching this webinar, it, it looks complicated, but it's actually, 100% uh, phonetic, so it makes it actually easier than English to read because English has all these silent words or letters or letters that don't pronounce the way they look, like phone, ph, and things like that. Um, but uh, the problem with uh, the syllabics really was uh, rooted in uh, the uh, which is the Inuit Cultural Institute. They standardized the syllabics uh, that had been created at the turn of the century. They standardized it in 1976, but they overlooked um, a number of uh, Nechilik sounds. And um, so they were, they were either not known or overlooked and um, it's a very isolated region. So uh, it was, uh, it became very difficult, uh, um, you know, a, a struggle but, um, back in the eighties when I was a regional interpreter, I actually just used a Sharpie or a, a big fine liner was my favorite <laughs> by hand. Um, and then, uh, 
the, the East uh, Qitung communities had been innovating on new symbols to add to the Aboriginal font set for Canada um, over the past 15 years. And there was a custom uh, font and uh, keyboard that was developed. And uh, the, for the life of me, my computer wouldn't uh, accept, <laughs> it wouldn't work on my computer. And uh, the font developer, the original uh, company, uh, they, they, there was no answers. So uh, the, the, the actual custom font was, uh, there, there, there's a lot of glitches when you do use a custom font. So um, the real answer would be to just um, get it incorporated into the Aboriginal font set. But during the two year, two plus year process of translating it, uh, what I ended up doing was um, copying and pasting each single letter or symbol that was missing. And there was uh, a total of, I think, 19 of them, because every time there's a dot on top of a, uh, a, a symbol, that's a separate uh, key stroke. So uh, it just made for a wider margin of error and a lot more proofing, uh, because the eye can be tricky, like, you know, uh, you, the, the letter, the symbol you, uh, it could be pronounced you, or if it's in Nechilik, it's you or it's ru. So we have two symbols that look similar, but one, it distinguishes between the sounds. So sometimes when you're looking at something for a long time, you get lost in, you, you, you know what it says. So you, your mind just tricks you and you can't see the typo. So that was a big one. Um, but I really uh, persisted in the effort uh, when, um, the elder that I worked with, Nila Olak, she really wanted to use this font for this project. So, um, and I also couldn't see any way of actually writing Natchiling Mutut in phonetically in syllabics without those uh, symbols. And the symbols that were developed were supported by many language experts, teachers, and language proponents from the East Qitil Mute from the Natchiling region. So to really honor that, we took extra time, we took extra effort. There were there was a lot more involved and especially um, Playwrights Canada Press, uh, Colleen and Siobhan, like the time, the space they gave for all of that uh, extra work was really remarkable. It was for every day. And uh, so there's a silver lining I just want to share quickly. Um, right when the manuscript was completed, the whole manuscript, the syllabics in English, I got a, a, a really random request uh, from a, a typographer from Toronto uh, asking for uh, a request for support for a proposal to include Natchili uh, symbols into the Aboriginal font set for all of Canada. And um, it was really unusual that he had just uh, searched the website looking for Aboriginal fonts that were missing. And he saw this article about Nilaulak in Nunatiak News. And it was an old article too. I think it was around uh, 2010, around the time that the uh, 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 Language Act in Nunavut was um, uh, 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 official. And uh, so uh, it was It was just in early October that this proposal that was developed was uh, approved by the governing body of the, um, it's uh, the Unicode uh, Consortium. So it's Unicode Font uh, Consortium. It's, it, they they uh, decide what goes in. And uh, this um, project was uh, among um, a number of uh, works that were submitted, uh, it, just a screenshot of this one, uh, but they could see the dedication, the use, the community uh, effort uh, to have all that in place. So that's a little bit about the technical, that was really hard. <laughs> it was a lot more work. <laughs> it was incredible. And from and from this book, like it's 305 pages, Colin? Yeah. 
And so the way that it reads is that there's the page uh, in English and then right following is the page in Anuktut in the syllabics. And so you'll get to look at the entire uh, play in that way. And I remember uh, reading that uh, Neil Aulak is, uh, is really excited about the book because this is the book that's going to be shared in the community and that they can now use this, the play as like a resource for language. And is it true that uh, that this is one of the largest documents in the Nulatsiak Mitut uh, dialect? Yes, it's the it, it is the longest manuscript in uh, Nechilimut dialect for sure. Um, there, there's uh, uh, there there's some children's books and uh, games that were produced by Hadlari Consulting. Um, there's uh, there. Uh, there's actually a Ukwik Seling Mute, which is a cousin dialect to Natchiling Mute in Joe Haven. The Ukwik Seling uh, post based di uh, dictionary is it was produced by uh, Nunavut Arctic College using the, the font as well. So, but this is actually, um, yeah, the longest, the most, <laughs> uh, most to read. <laughs> Incredible. And I'm just thinking, I know that Siobhan Arnatsiak uh, Murphy wasn't able to join us today, but I just want to acknowledge the deep, deep work that uh, she has done working also with Colleen and Janet in and looking at the play uh, with really that Inuit lens and that Inuit perspective. And I wouldn't mind Colleen just hearing about uh, working with Siobhan and, and how that's really uh, impacted the work, the play. Well, we, we, we really worked, uh, her and I worked on it very closely. So, uh, so she would, I, I would send her, you know, some text and she would read it and she would, we would talk on the phone. It was always on the phone. And she would say, this should be this, this should be this, because this means this. And so she was very uh, 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 astute in, in, in taking, say, a, a line, a, a relationship, and going, it would be uh, said this way. So she, that's what she's doing with my English, okay? So mm -hmm. she's doing this uh, with my English. Now, here's the thing that gets complicated. So my English was translated into the, into the syllabics. Janet did that. And then Janet did this amazing thing. She, you re, she, re, she retranslated. In other words, she took the syllabics and translated them into English. But it's not my English. It's the English that comes out of the syllabics. And it's different. There's different emphasis. There's different perspective. So I would then take some of that language, cherry pick it, sometimes take a whole phrase. And like Jan and I, we work so close together and I would, that would go in the script. And then that would go to Siobhan and she would look at that and go, oh, okay, yeah, okay. It was a constant three-way checking, double checking, double checking, double checking, you know, uh, and that's how we work together. And we work together, all, all the three of us to, to serve the story uh, it culturally and linguistically in every possible way. I wanna talk about, thank you. I wanna talk about this story because um, I, like, I'm, I'm a Western Arctic Inuk. I'm, I'm from the uh, Nuvialuit, so the, I'm from the uh, Aklavik Inuvik region and my relatives came from Alaska originally. And uh, with this play, it was very specifically uh, in that Nutskalik region. And thank, you know, we were well guided by Kagevut, Kagevut uh, to, you know, um, to connect it to a region, specific region uh, that the play originated. And then to work with uh, Nilaulak, um, we found, uh, like I'd never heard about the woman who adopted a bear. And so what was really inspiring was to learn that the story that, you had written was connected to this community and that we had met an elder who knew the who knew that origin story of uh, of the woman who adopted the bear and what's incredible about this 
this process, the deep process of working with Siobhan, working with Janet, working with yourself, is that you know this the breadth of time it takes to to find and discover and know roots of story. Like what Ken had written about uh, in the opening introduction of the play, what I reflected was how much knowledge we carry in relation of story and place. And that story means connection to true knowledge and people. And so I, I, I was pretty inspired and I, I wouldn't mind hearing more uh, about Nilaulak and, and how it came to be that the story, that your story went to, to Nilaulak in Joe Haven. Janet, I think that, that that's all, that's you. <laughs> take it or take it away. <laughs> oh, uh, well, my first step was to call me Laulak. Um, and uh, I actually summarized all three acts to her. I had the English uh, in front of me and we, we were on the phone for a couple hours and uh, I, I just uh, simultaneously uh, translated it just off the page, like reading it in English and speaking it out in a way that uh, was some, some in summarizing it for her. And uh, she was really emphatic about using the Nechilik font really at that point. And uh, be before I discovered that my computer would uh, not, not accept it. Uh, it was in my computer and I'd used it before, but some kind of update to the system had uh, precluded that. Um, so she was uh, she was really oh, there was there's so much about that conversation and some other conversations that that followed that. Um, I should say that there were two things that really uh, connected her to the play as it is in uh, English when when we did that reading. The summary reading was that um, she felt that the authors had really been connected to the actual essence of the story, the essential um, meaning, uh, what it's for, because stories have, have uh, it's not just like lesson, like moral of the story or something, it's, it's like a deeper, um, it's they're instructive, educational for sure, but there, there there was something like a feeling about this story. The overall feeling of it was um, was was that that it, the authors were very true to that. Uh, even though it's a short story in the Chilling Mutude and short in in general, like wherever you see a, a version of it, um, and so to expand it into a. a uh, a very like a three act play uh, that that everything about that play just just went back to the to the basis of the uh, of the traditional version. That was one thing, and then the other thing was um, was that um, the the overall uh, theme, um, which relates to climate change. Uh, was very uh, connectable for her as well. And there's a lot of um, like um, Inuit laws, uh, mute laws for the land and for the animals. Um, there's one like, for example, and that relates to, I guess in English, you just say respect for animals. Um, and uh, uh, so there, there are graphic scenes in the in the play, but it it uh, uh, traditional stories. Uh, Nilaulak is a master storyteller, and there's a lot of stories that she tells that are very graphic as well. And there's there's an understanding of what that is. Like it's it's not it's not like when we watch maybe. Um, something in modern uh, culture that's horror, maybe something for the sake of gore, or I don't know. <laughs> I don't watch that. <laughs> I can't watch Walt Disney without getting an anxiety attack. 
<laughs> so, um, but her, her stories I listened to when I was a kid too, like she's, uh, it, there, you know, you get real, you get real squeamish. Um, but she really uh, appreciated uh, the, the essential messages, the respect for Sila, Hila, the, uh, for, for, for um, the land and living things. So, uh, and there's a lot of um, prohibitions, like she, you know, uh, talked about in these conversations, she brought, it, it all came, she was saying when she was young, uh, her mom would always say, never uh, dig the earth, like with your hands, uh, that type of thing, because you're, you're um, disturbing it. And so like, you know, the question of um, mining is, is, um, or oil uh, drilling and whatnot is very uh, sensitive uh, from a um, from her perspective, and that 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 there that there are really serious consequences, and we're actually living the consequences now in real time, in in a way that we would have never could have possibly imagined uh, on a in a on an international scale, a global mm -hmm. scale. Um, And also in that conversation, she oh she went over the um, the story of the woman, uh, her version, and I didn't have a recorder, and I, I you know I listened, and I was just you know it was beautiful, and every time a storyteller will tell a story, it will be different each time. So it's like I said to her, well I'm going to figure out how to use the, my little recorder and and you know get your version like I'll, I'll I would like to record it for you and then uh, and then I I, uh, I uh, transliterated it into syllabics natulic syllabics and then I translated it and this was all for her her work because uh, one of the things that uh, uh, evolved from our conversation were all the things she would love to do with her story uh, and right away uh i think it was even in the first that first conversation i just did a three-way call very quickly with colleen and uh we talked about i just shared like nila Olak said you know her creatively like what she really could see with um not not the story the adapted story the the ugloo the breathing hole but the actual original story like how she would like to use it for language reclamation in the community, for literacy work, for um, working with youth, like, and then, you know, um, Stratford and uh, yourself, Renalta and Colleen, like you all said, like, that you would support the community under Nila Olak's direction to explore anything they wanted to and learn about stage uh, production and backdrop and all these things, but, but it's all, it's all um, kind of surrounding the um, quest for language reclamation and revitalization. So connecting for Nilaula, connecting the richness of her generation's language with the possibility today that there are some, there are youth that are, uh, it's, it's different than someone who's just never heard the language. They've been around it all their life, but they might be like, um, a passive uh, speaker, a, a silent speaker is another word that's used in linguistics. Mm. Um, I did run a uh, immersion course uh, uh, for youth uh, in Nakchilik region uh, in 2015, and uh, it, it was open to uh, you know all ages. There, the youngest one was about 15, and the oldest was about 40. And um, there was, we didn't use a single word of English that people were, uh, there, there was a level of functionality in Nechilik region that was phenomenal uh, and, and very different from the Western side of that uh, region, the Qitilmut region, uh, that uh, the language loss uh, is uh, further, uh, further ahead with uh, Inuit Naktu. But because Nechilik dialect is so, I mean, the Nechilik region is so isolated, it takes from even anywhere in Nunavut, it takes um, it, an, 
uh, like if you're in uh, Rankin, it will take you two days to get to Joe Haven. Or if you're in Iqaluit, you have to go through Rankin, Yellowknife, sleep over, and then go to Joe Haven. Wow. Or from the south, from Ottawa, you could go Edmonton and then hopefully make a, a full run to Joe Haven the next day or stay over in Yellowknife. <laughs> but it's like, it's very far away uh, in so many ways. Uh, internet's not that strong. Um, and so this, this, this project has really brought a lot of the world to the community uh, and, and really surrounded around priorities that they have for their language, their artistic work, their elders, and their stories. And so it was a really, um, you know, it's just really exciting to witness it and be a part of the all, all the com conversations that were going on in the community and sharing them with Colleen and, and asking um, about, uh, you know, all the different possibilities for things that could be done. Um, yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Incredible. So it's like beautiful community engagement and how we work with community, which is so important. You know, I looked at the, I looked at all the Inuit uh, collaborators when we did the Breathing Hole at Stratford and there's just so many uh, Inuit. We had the dramaturgy group with Kagia Root. We had, uh, we had costume, we had props, we had language, we had the Inuit tattooing, we had some of the naming and, and there it, it's kind of, um, you know, this is, to me, it's just the beginning. And this was a different writing process for you, Colleen, because normally the writing process you have is, is, is like the way that you've had it. But seeing how you've done work with the breathing hole and then with the latest work that you were doing in, in uh, Montreal and Quebec, like, do you want to talk about how your writing style was influenced by these projects? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, you know, it's, it, it's impo for me, and I speak only for myself, it was impossible, uh, you know, I wrote the, the breathing hole because of the climate emergency, right? But mm -hmm. you cannot write about the climate emergency and not write about the North. I mean, it's an, an inseparable uh, situation, right? So, uh, you know, the, the bones of the story, the structure of the story and some, most of the characters, <clears throat> I could I could get and grab onto, but the it's it's like there's the skeleton. Now we're gonna get the flesh. <laughs> now we're gonna build the flesh on the bones, right? And you gotta be quite precise about you know what muscle goes where and how it works, right? Otherwise you have the arm the arm stuck on the head and that just doesn't work and you don't even know that it's wrong. <laughs> so that was really really good and the process was this process on the breathing hole was extremely helpful uh, working uh, uh, collaboratively. So you're not only looking for me as the, you know, as the author, not only looking at language and translation and retranslation, you know, I'm a, it's also cultural as, as, you know, Janet's been speaking about, it's uh, things being confirmed for me and me learning things in, in the best way. All of this I took into my next project, which also, <laughs> <laughs> ridiculous has, <laughs> has 39 characters and is of course the battle of the plains of abraham in 1759 uh, and with animals and with people um uh, and working with uh very closely with a wendat consultant in uh in, in quebec a city uh and again learning how to go back and forth, back and forth. It's about mutuality, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and there is an ease to that and a kind of openness, eh, eh Janet? Because we, we have that, right? Like it becomes very easy and you know, you make mistakes, we make mistakes and we, and we correct them. And it's not about my ego, you know, oh, I'm, the author, I must possess this sentence, right? No, no, it's just not about that. Everything is to make the play better. Everything is to make the moment of that character in that scene the best it can possibly be. And that includes cultural expression. It includes linguistic expression. It includes everything so that it's all, all of a piece. 
so it's been a great great learning experience i just i just i just loved it uh it was um big huge and and sometimes you know difficult to negotiate but that's okay i have no problem with that you know that's how you learn and that's uh that's what i'll bring into you know my next work oh my god i hope it's not like too many characters but it's that openness to like i know i can reach out and and i hope that you know we can work together again across culturally um in in depending on the story right mm -hmm. this is i say is difficult you can't really write historical stuff you can't write them and not include the indigenous culture indigenous characters right that's how it happened you can't exactly. do that. That's not history anymore. No, it's not. It's 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 a it's our history. It's not a singular perspective history anymore. And I think that that's why this is so important. And it's in, and it's good to know that it isn't easy because I I feel like that's where a lot of people are um, like uh, hesitant or they're hesitant to go forward because they're afraid that they're going to get it wrong or that there there's that like that uh that anxiety that comes with it but when you dive in and you dig in it the the work just is so rich and so necessary and it allows multiple voices to to be part of the production at multiple levels oh you said and, that multiple voices you said it yeah and when you work with language you know um we're in different arts in art disciplines as people are working with indigenous language they're always acknowledging that language is living and so when you talk about like you getting it wrong when you do when you write a word down and then you add context to it that word changes and then when you, when you add intention to it then that word changes again and because the language is living and transforming and so there's never ever a direct translation it's a living it's a living relationship between the between the languages that speak to one another. And that's why it's so powerful when you talk about Siobhan. I didn't know that it was going to Janet, to Siobhan, back, back to you, back to Janet, back to Siobhan. That's so incredible and we, so rich. We were a menage a toi. <laughs> I know, how incredible. I, I know we're getting close to time and I do want to leave space for questions because this is so fruitful, but I wouldn't, we wouldn't be where we are if we weren't all really impacted and 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 uh, that are reflective on the times regarding climate change and climate climate emergency actually and so i know that 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 part of the play really brought us to conversate together and so i just want to chat with like i want to hear um each of you and 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 what's impacting like how is climate change? What is it important about you? What what hopes do you have? You know, um, that kind of like what inspired what inspired the breathing hole was was the climate. Janet, what do you? <laughs> well, I'll be short because I I did mention um, the uh, about. Um, uh, about uh, Nila Olak's um, response to the um, the summary, uh, but just just to just to kind of put those two things together, the the essence of the um, the story, it's really about feeling in a certain way, and uh, the the audio of her um, recording is available. Uh, um, on online at uh, tamalik.com on the splash page. You just look at the breathing hole cover and click, you will hear um, her original audio recorded version. And in it, you'll hear the emotions of the mother calling out to the bear. And this is a chosen relationship. This is something that... Um, the word tiguak adopted it, it comes from the uh, the, the verb tigu to 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 um, to grab to and it, it's something like a something precious and something precious is grabbed and the, the relationship this woman was a was a widowed she was alone she was looked down on kind of ostracized 
in some ways marginalized and she found something to love and she put her heart into this this uh, this being who grew up in the best way possible in the Inuk way um, to be of service to the community and and then it turned the 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 story turns you can read the whole story Nilao Lak's version in the breathing hole book in itself is available um, in the book so I won't go into it but the point is that her original was really about the feeling of it's not just the feeling of the feeling towards the climate towards our um, environment but it's feeling between each other and between all living beings, all living things, and the really sacredness of that bond. Um, and I, I say all these words in English and they don't really feel like they really express what it really feels like. But when I was translating Colleen and Siobhan's work, I laughed, I cried, I, 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 I giggled. It, it it brought me through all of the range of possibility to this feeling of devastation, and it, it was truly devastating. Like, and it was hard because I had to proof the thing so many times. <laughs> and it was like, oh, here it comes. I know, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't just, I couldn't just proof it. I had to. I, it was just like this river, and it was just. It, it's so powerful. So I, I, I think that they really were grounded in something very genuine that um, is, is just a real treat for the readers and for uh, the, the theater community to experience that when we're able to have that on stage again. Um, it's incredible. And so the message really is, it's for our times, absolutely. And I, I, it's just such a privilege to have been part of this. Yeah. yeah, when we think about the future, Colleen, I know that the, the ending time had to change because it felt like you were predicting the future in some ways. I almost had a heart attack when I heard that Trump was gonna drill in the, in the Alaska you know, refuge a, a couple of weeks ago. And I, and I almost fell over when I read somewhere, I think Janet, it, you shared an article with me uh, or people uh, developing um, fake ice, you know, to, uh, to take up, some, you know, so the sun doesn't go into the water. And, and I thought, yeah, that's weird. But, um, you know, uh, and Janet and I have talked a lot about this, man, the climate emergency is an emergency. It's a 911. And it's so far away. And it's hard to write about, eh, as a play. Like, people go, oh, God, a climate emergency. Oh, I don't know what that is. It's, it's something up there. It's, uh, it's somewhere else. It's down in California in the wildfires. But the thing is, I, for me, it was the bear. I had to, to offer the audience a, a, a being, a being that they could care for, that they could love, that they could meet, they go all these things to go through all this stuff with him and uh, his mate and this and that. And then, you know, reality, uh, it, you know, it's, it's quite, it is, it's devastating at the end. Um, and I never wanted to talk about climate change. Uh, I just wanted people to feel it because I don't think it's easy to care about unless you feel it. Uh, and I know I'm writing an, another play that is very much on about the climate emergency. And again, how do you go in? How do you get the audience to give a shit, right? This time it's a kid, right? Because like kids and animals and they're kind of, it's easy, it's easier to relate to them for some, in sometimes with something that seems so dry and far away as, as the climate emergency. Yeah, I just remember the impact of, of the audience, um, the ending, it, it devastated audience members. I remember sitting in the audience watching because we were doing previews and the lights would come up and there was a, a good solid amount of people that just couldn't move. They just couldn't move. And 
you know it's coming, but you don't know in the way that it is. And I think that that's how climate change can work. It's like, it's so far away and then it's like right in your face. And you know, that's the power of your writing, Colleen, is that you're very good at creating something and then it, it just getting you right in the heart and the gut. And that's like a strength that, that you have. And it was pretty incredible to be able to work with the work in that way and to build the world with you and, and, and with the work that you've created. And, and uh, like that, the bear, like Angurak is a very powerful, powerful bear. And it's, you know, it's an incredible puppet. I want to leave space for Q&A, but I know we've been talking about Neil Aulak's story, and I have a little clip from your website, and so I'm just going to share my screen. It's going to be a little rough. I've got a lot of tabs there, but uh, I'm going to play a few, a, a minute or so of it, and then we're going to jump in. So just bear with me, team. Doo -doo -doo. Look at all the stuff I have. Do uh, do do. Okay, can you see that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Powerful. I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. Oh, there was no sound. Oh my gosh, it worked earlier. I'm so sorry. What we'll do is we'll, it's on the uh, website there. So you're just looking at my face, feeling everything. Oh my gosh. She's got such a great voice, eh? My oh, God. it's so good. Yeah. There we go. So please, please check out her story. I've just put the link in the chat there. And it's on Janet's website. And you have to hear uh, the telling of the story. It's quite, quite powerful. So we have a few moments. Let's do some Q&A. Um, so there's a question. Did the process of translation add anything to your own creative process? Um, yes, absolutely. It was, uh, I'd never done something like that before. Um, and it did, like I say, uh, I, I always knew that each word had meaning and carried many things, uh, but I guess what I, what I learned was that it, it carries much, much more, uh, as Janet was saying earlier, you know, there's, a, there's everything, the word brings everything out. I would uh, like to add that um, uh, this is, uh, it, it's been the most uh, impactful and enjoyable uh, translation from English to Inuktu, or yeah, English to Inuktu that I've ever done in my life. Mm. And um, usually now, nowadays, I've, uh, for, for a number of years, I've specialized in uh, oral histories, transcription, and translating English as a specialty. Uh, so, um, just because way back in the day, in the 80s, I got, um, became very aware that the government documents were just that. It was what the government was saying to the people. So, I knew of the richness that was there in the community and wanted to focus on that. But um, I, I think this, this work has been a real treat too. Uh, and artistically very amazing to work with such fine artists all around is like, 
truly amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, I second oh. that. <laughs> we have Ken Harper. Hello, Ken Yay! Harper. Hi, watching Ken. us. He has a question. Of course, it's history based. So uh -huh. he's saying, Janet, are the Nettling mute experiencing any type of Franklin fatigue, my term, as a result of the Franklin events of recent years? Are they deriving any benefits from the Franklin interest? Uh, well, I would only know through the uh, through Nilaulak. Um, I think the community in general might, when I've been in Joe Haven, there's this uh, sense of um, the outside world is, you know, interested, and it's a very isolated region, so it's almost like a like a compliment in a way. I don't, I don't think fatigue would have ever come to mind uh, in that regard, in that environment. Uh, yeah, when I was working with the um, play uh, characters, uh, the names with Nilaulak, uh, she was using words that were from the oral histories of Joe Haven about Franklin. So, Akotirwak. Mm is um means the uh, literally it means the big driver the the one that drives so he was the the captain uh then there's also the borrowed word of capitaya which is captain and that's used in um in one of the uh, acts not the uh uh i'm not sure which one i think it's act two uh, but uh, but anyway so there was a lot of interaction that was uh what I felt it was well received because uh, people want to remember, and these are not chilling mute oral histories of living history in the area, living history of contact, and people. It, it's recorded, uh, like say on on you know video or old cassette tape or whatever. But but to dialogue about it and to share uh, that 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 was um I, yeah I didn't sense any fatigue. <laughs> I just want to acknowledge that Ken, uh, he wrote, I was asked, uh, Stratford, when you do the program, you get to invite someone to write uh, a context about the play that isn't uh, the lens of the playwright. And uh, I'd ask like, Ken Harper, because he is a respected historian and, and has a lot of that knowledge. And then in turn, you asked him, Colleen, to write for the play as well. Yes, he, he wrote the foreword. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. <laughs> so it's nice to join us. Uh, I don't have any questions. Is there any more questions from anyone? Um, oh, let me take a peek here. Oh, here we go. I saw the beautiful production at Stratford and so agree that it was incredibly moving. I was one of those people almost unable to speak at the end, so thank you. My question is about the effect of the translation. Would love to hear more about how learning more about the meanings of the Nutzling mute words may have affected the English and the story itself. So that's quite good. I know in the book, I, I looked at the PDF and in the PDF, there's just like what you mentioned about uh, Sir John Franklin, how he was in, how he was translated. And so there's, if, when you, when you purchase, when you purchase the book in there is a lot of the breakdown of, of how the words were translated into the, like to the people themselves or, or how to pronounce the words properly. And there's an, a quite, a quite a extensive glossary there. I mean, it, just uh, building on what you said, you know, when, if you look at the play just strictly as a drama, right? Like I know uh, there, you know, there were little sections that were funny in, 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 in my English. So, <laughs> but for Janet, it is not funny in the culture. <laughs> so, you know, we had to negotiate that and find a way because, you know, I have to also serve the drama of, of the piece. And uh, so it was interesting uh, when you say, you know, what changed in the English. We, you know, all the way through, there's, uh, there's, tiny things that were shifted and big things that were shifted in terms of the language to uh, to honor uh, to honor everything culturally but also to to find a way to honor the drama the drama mm. yeah 
th there were a few spots where um, the humor uh, didn't translate, and yet I could understand from having a bit of a theater background too that that the the levity and that that interaction is necessary uh, uh, for the for the drama part. So I wasn't um, suggesting to change the English, but I just really had to figure out how to how to work around it. And uh, in a couple of cases, there was uh, using wordplay, just mm. that that the that the reader would get an inner giggle because there was something just like just funny about the way the word was put together. But it was in the context of the character, so uh, there was you know asking Colleen like you know what is this character in this moment and what what's the what's going on inside and or what's your intention and so on. So uh, that kind of discussion was always really interesting and I've made a list of them all and they will be in a, a forthcoming blog it's just that I'm new to getting back to uh, I have an old blog that I couldn't even get into <laughs> to uh, publish the information so I'll, I'm working on that so stay tuned <laughs> I think there's another one yeah thank you so interesting um, I just want to offer a lot of thanks. So I'm going to go into the PDF and I'm just going to thank the Inuit that were evolved, uh, that were part of the uh, Breathing Hole production that we did at Stratford. And just to acknowledge that, you know, many voices, as we kind of um, touched on earlier, were a part of this. And so there were, you know, on the stage themselves, we were able to invite three Inuit actors. We brought Miali Bushemi in, Uyarnik uh, from Greenland and 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 Johnny uh, from uh, Khalilid. And it wasn't enough to bring Inuit into the play. You you have to build the vision. And that's why I was really grateful to be brought in as the director. So being the first time at Stratford, it's a it's a it's a big machine, but it wasn't um, it wasn't so it was it was incredible to see how uh, this big machine could work with Inuit process. And so in the development of the play, we had Kagyubu join for Inuit dramaturgy and cons uh, cultural consultation. That was Siobhan Arnatziak Murphy, Lakuluk Williamson Bathory, Miali Bushemi, who then became part of the cast, Mary Itorchek, uh, Vinnie Karatak, Alika Komangapik, and Annabella Piagatuk. And they really led the, the first part of this, of the development of the play. From there, we went in translation. And so I reached out to a, a high school friend of mine, Kevin Ituluk out of Tuluyak, and Arnaoyok Aluki, who was the elder that he worked with in that community. And that's how we initially got the names, but working with Janet, those names shifted uh, and uh, for good reason uh, in that as the language, like I said, language is living. And so when you lose, when you move with intention and, and, uh, and focus then it changes. Uh, we had we had uh, Kumata, uh, I call him Kuzi. So we had Kuzi Curly join us who, to build some props. Um, in that way, I, I just felt it was important to when we bring in those those um, those materials and those tools that you know that lens that Inuit lens is so vital and important. And you know the skill set expanding. So we had Beatrice Deer join us for costuming with uh, to work with Joanna Yu. We had Lucy Tulagarjo come in as a makeup consultant, which was pretty incredible. She she's a, a famous actor, great director, and uh, but she when she worked on the the Fast Runner, she was the one that did the Inuit tattooing for that film. And I reached out to her, and they uh, she was able, uh, Stratford brought her in to teach the wig and makeup department how to do Inuit tattooing that that mm -hmm. had an, an awareness to it. Um, and I just want to thank. Um, the, those people that came and of course the people that came to support the, the production itself. We had so many Inuit coming into the audience throughout the entire run. And it was just really grateful to have that support come, then come all the way to Stratford to, to be part of the audience. And you always knew when Inuit were in the, in the audience because they were laughing uh, during act two. <laughs> <laughs> they were laughing so hard. And so I just want to acknowledge all of those incredible people that 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 generously offered their time and and uh, and their and their focus to to the to the building of the work. I'd like to add uh, Ellen Hamilton, and I'd mm -hmm. also like to add uh, who you know got us all together and got us going. Uh, also, um, 
the National Arts Center who came in for this huge translation. Uh, Samantha McDonald, you know, Jillian Kiley, Kevin Loring at the Indigenous uh, Theater at, the, at NAC. Um, and also uh, the Playwrights Canada Press was open to this huge project uh, and, uh, and open to all of these voices and all of the time and work uh, that they did to produce this book which made make a beautiful oh, look at that. Oh my God. And also the Stratford Festival, this is where this cover comes from. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Um, so there's a question of, you know, in the language preservation, Inuktut is a very small market. Um, will there be a government support in getting a bulk purchase of this book so that it could be provided to schools in the north? And so I know that you're working with the Playwright Canada Press and yourself and ourselves, all of us are involved in making sure that the book can be as accessible as possible. Well, I, I know that 200 copies are being donated up, no, to, up north. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, it, it is a, uh, it, it's important to get the book out there, you know, across, across languages. Mm -hmm. Well, Kuyanik. Kuyanini, thank you so much to uh, to be invited to this space, Jessica. And I'm really grateful. And I am so happy to see your faces, Colleen and Janet. Like, it just means so much. Thank you to all of you for doing this, spending your Friday evening here with us. And thank you to everyone who's watching. Um, this is truly a special, special piece of art uh, that we're so happy to have, have a part in. So. Thank you again. <laughs> mm -hmm. And to everyone, if you want to hear more, Colleen and Janet will be doing a reading on December 8th. Um, and I'll post the link in the chat. But yeah, so thank you for everybody for being here. And that was great. <laughs> I just want to add uh, the background here. I'm, I'm new to Zoom backgrounds, but uh, this is um, these are polar bear tracks behind me. And uh, wow. I took the picture. <laughs> it was in Arviat Nunavut. I just wanted to. Um, bring Arviat in, a very creative, wonderful community too. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Awesome, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, good night everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.